Hello and welcome to this special debate from Davos produced by France 24 and the World Economic Forum. The list of cities hit by bloody and brutal attacks in the past year is long. Ankara, Beirut, San Bernardino, Paris and many more have fallen victim. Just this week, gunmen stormed a university in northwest Pakistan, killing 20 people. The spread of the attacks serve as a reminder of the global threat posed by violent extremism. Thousands of people are killed every year and whole communities are left terrorized. Poverty and social injustice are seen as contributing factors, but the picture is a lot more complicated. In this debate, we're asking how well we understand the root causes of violent extremism and how to find solutions at local levels. Now, our panel today is uh, diverse. Its members have backgrounds in uh, politics, culture, business, the clergy and uh, law. Thank you very much, first of all, to all of you uh, for being here. And I'm going to introduce our panel participants. Uh, closest to me, I have uh, Rosh Noor Shawazi. He is uh, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq. Elif Shafak is a best-selling Turkish author. Sir Mohammed Jafar is a businessman from the Middle East, an industrial from, from the region. Justin Welby is the Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jean-Paul Laborde, Assistant Secretary General at the United Nations and Executive Director of the UN's Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. Now, we're going to start this session by talking about the current context uh, in the Middle East, but also elsewhere. And uh, I want to uh, start with you, uh, Mr. Shawiz, because we remember 2014 when the Islamic State group swept across uh, Iraq, and uh, it still holds significant territories in the country. Could you update us where we are at the moment and where we are with the fight against uh, Islamic State group? Yes, indeed, it is You're asking about the military situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, this situation now in Iraq in general is in comparison with the situation a year before is uh, much better and it indicates much more confident about the f military future of the of the fight against Daesh. Uh, a year ago from now, Daesh occupied uh, a lot of territories in Iraq, among them major towns, Sunni towns, like uh, Mosul, Ramadi, Tikrit and others. Now the only remaining town, which is awaiting also the, the uh, uh, the last battle, is the Mosul uh, province and town itself. So uh, we have made a lot of progress. In the beginning, with the help of the alliance, we stopped the attacks of Daesh. We showed our population that Daesh is not undefeatable. It is, in, on the contrary, is defeatable, military. And we have stopped them in a front line, which is about 1,000 kilometers long from, from Western Iraq until Austin, Ost, east mm -hmm. of Iraq. Uh, now so, there is cooperation and negotiation between all uh, stakeholders, let's say Iraqi government, Kurdistan regional government, Peshmerga, Iraqi army, population for Mosul and the alliance to prepare the last battle against Daesh. I wanted to ask you about that. You, you've already touched upon it there, but how has the way that Iraq it deals with Daesh or Islamic State group changed in the past two years? Ha have you changed strategy? Have you changed tactics? Well, to be honest, this matter needs much more uh, consideration, uh, analysis and consideration. First of all, Daesh emerged from Islamic countries, from all countries, so it has something to do with Islam. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it has something to do with the order of our, the system of our countries. Uh, I cannot say that we in Iraq, we have solved all these problems in a situation, in, a, in, a, in a such a way 
that we can say now we have a climate which is against emergent, emergence of, of Daesh or similar organizations. The only progress which has been done actually is in the military field, on the field. And this is primarily, also to be honest, was achie achievable because or through the help of the alliance. Uh, Sir Mohammed uh, Jafar, I want to turn to you. You're, you're also from, from this region. And I want to ask you what you think the root cause is of violence extremism. What motivates young men uh, to go out, go out, take up arms, uh, and join Islamic State group or Daesh? I don't know that there's a precise answer to the question. Um, to put your finger on it, people join ISIS like people join gangs or drug dealers. Um, it could be, I mean, what are ISIS selling? They're selling death. And who buys into that? You cannot be a normal person. Um, it could be a psychopath or a sociopath. It's been advanced that some people join them because um, they're not well-to-do, because they feel left out. There could be percentage in that, but not necessarily. Some kids are joining them from university um, in the UK. Um, they have good grades. They, their families don't seem to know why they have joined. Some predict that this is possibly a generational issue that these children who were born in the West um, to parents who were not originally from the West feel lost. They don't feel that they belong to their native culture and that they don't belong to the culture of the host country. They don't seem to understand their parents or their parents don't seem to understand them. And so they buy into this um, Camelot that um, the fake caliphate is, um, is selling. And um, I think that we have a duty to protect the vulnerable as a society. So um, if some of our kids um, are at risk of being um, predated upon by um, child abusers, you protect them. Drug dealers, you protect them. Um, and likewise, if they're being preyed upon by ISIS, we have a duty to protect them. Now, they get preyed upon online. And to my mind, um, we have lost this marketing battle. And we shouldn't have lost the marketing battle. The brand ISIS shouldn't exist. It should be weakened. And we must weaken it. And they give us all the ammunition that we need. But and I address this to those present from the media today. Are we doing everything that we can with the stories that come to uh, The other day, um, a member of Daesh um, told on his own mother, uh, who was asking him to leave Daesh. And either he killed her or she was killed by the network. These are people, they are mother killers at the end of the day. Why isn't that a story? Why doesn't the media, why does the media just report this? Why doesn't this, why doesn't it become big? Uh, Secretary Kerry earlier mentioned two examples, one in Norway where Muslims went and hugged um, a synagogue, and another example from my country, Kuwait, after it was attacked, um, where the Sunni population went in solidarity with the Shiite population and prayed in that mosque and uh, is pledging to uh, rebuild the mosque that was destroyed by a suicide bomber. This is the ammunition that Daesh gave us. I don't think we are giving the traction that is needed, and I don't think that we are doing enough online to kill the brand. Kill the brand, kill the demand. Uh, Jean-Paul Abad, I want to turn to you next, because uh, figures from the Institute of Economics and Peace show that uh, 32,000 people died in terror attacks in 2014, which was a clear uptick uh, from 2013. And 2014, by the way, is the last year that we have figures from. Uh, is this problem currently getting better or worse from your perspective when, when we look at these numbers? 
Well, first of all, since you spoke about victims, let's also think about the victims have paid tribute to them. That's some, something I want to do here. Um, the second point is that there are two um, main uh, ways, avenues, to work against uh, terrorism. First of all, the preventative side, which is enormously important. And the second, for, and the second if, of course, not only the military side, but the law enforcement side. Plus, plus of course, the diplomacy. So if you, if you ask me, the answers are already given by my two predecessors. We are first to defeat Daesh, that's for sure. But we cannot defeat Daesh if we not convince the people, um, the young people especially, including the young women who go there, that is not an option. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a point. Da Daesh is not an option for them. So what they want to do is probably for them adventure, for them, for others, other things, who knows exactly. Because there is not a single answer. This is a multi-facet uh, 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 issue. So what can be the prospect? First of all, we have to address the prospect in giving the right signals to all the communities. I think this, that's something which has been done by the Secretary General last week uh, in issuing the uh, plan against uh, the plans for the prevent, prevention of violent extremism. That's uh, uniting uh, religions, uh, speaking about all the elements like uh, education, etc. So I think that the uh, human rights, rule of law, etc. So the, if we are, um, I would like to say, uh, strong enough to promote all the aspects, this multifaceted policy, my answer is yes, we can probably make a difference. If we are still doing only one thing or another one, and if we are, if we are not united, both, by the way, the Shiites, the, uh, uh, the Sunnis, the, the, the countries, and the, and the churches, we will be we will continue to face the same difficulties. Because Daesh is not contrary with, uh, with what um, I, I really uh, felt when I saw some, uh, some of their propaganda. Daesh is not a, a place in which you have welfare. Absolutely not. So we have really to, to look into the matter in this way. and. Um, to have also a very good counter propaganda. Mm -hmm. We are very bad at that. I think we are not good in terms of uh, uh, communication. You have That's something in common there with, with, with Sir Mohammed, and we're going we're gonna to come back, yeah. back to that point. I, I just want to turn to uh, Elif Shafak for, for a moment, because, uh, well, I want to turn to, to culture, and that is one of your main messages. You say that culture is under attack by violent extremism. And I want to show our audience and read our audience a quote from a piece that you wrote in The Guardian after the Paris attacks in November. You wrote that uh, in the fight against extremism, political analysis dominates discussions while military solutions hover in the background. Culture, however, does not receive enough attention, even though it is at the heart of today's conflicts. Tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yes, I do believe it's at the heart of today's conflicts. And if you want to develop a counter-propaganda, or let's call it a counter-narrative, perhaps, culture definitely needs to be part of it. The thing is, I mean, today, walk into any bookstore, you will come across dozens of books on Islam, Islamic extremism, particularly newspapers, magazines. You turn, you know, you open it, dozens of articles. There's a lot of information about the subject. But I'm afraid there's less understanding and even less wisdom about it. Now, for understanding, we need culture. In order to get to know better a, a geography, a region, a country, we also have to understand its culture. One of the things that extremisms of all kinds can't stand is multiplicity, is pluralism. When you look at, when you dismantle the discourse of fundamentalism, basically they're saying, Make your choice. 
Are you one of us? Are you one of them? Are you here? Are you there? Now, culture says, and people in the world of culture, we say the opposite. We say it's possible to be multiple. It's possible to have multiple belongings. So what extremism says, if you are a French Muslim, you can't be both, they say. Okay, choose your side. Be only a Muslim and forget your European identity. What we say is just the opposite. Yes, you can be a Muslim, you can be a secularist, you can be European, you can be a world citizen, and many things more. You can be multiple selves. So we have to understand this attack against multiplicity, against diversity, is a very integral part of this problem. And when we look at the practice of extremism, particularly in the Middle East, starting with Syria, how they attack historical sites, archaeological sites, uh, but also beyond Syria. It is not a coincidence. There's a systematic attack against things that we can call as our shared humanity, because those sites don't belong to the Syrian government. They don't belong to any group or any you know, sectarian politics. They belong to humanity. It's part of our common history. So I think it's not a coincidence that they're deliberately attacking these sites and raising it down. When we look at the Paris attack, Again, they did not aim military sites or financial districts and financial sites. It was a lifestyle that was attacked. It was concerts, restaurants, you know, a certain way of living, but primarily culture. We need to understand that culture needs to be part of this discussion. And I do believe that people in the world of culture also need to start speaking up louder. Archbishop, I also want to show our audience a quote from an article that, that, that you wrote in Prospect magazine uh, back in 2014. You, you wrote that this struggle is not simply a religious conflict, but a terrible mix of ethnicity, economics, social unrest, injustice between rich and poor, limited access to resources, historic hatreds, post-colonial conflict and more. Uh, often though, in the media, this is described as a religious conflict. Why do you think th that is? Why is that there? that temptation to do that? Because it's an easy hook to hang things on. It simplifies things down. It means you can identify who's bad and who's good very quickly. You have a clear enemy. And the people who make the most of the identification as, uh, in religious conflict are those who want to manipulate those within religious communities. Of course, it has very clear religious aspects. In fact, that's one of the things we completely forget. Uh, very often in the way we analyze the problem. We, we look at, and listening today to various things I've been at, you hear a lot about the sociology and the economics and uh, many things like that, and those are absolutely crucial. I don't want to understate them at all. What you don't hear is what I'm hearing in this panel, which is very, very striking, is the, is the narrative, and particularly the cultural, ideological, and theological narrative and how that presents something that is much more attractive than the extremism. We need to remember it's not just Daesh. That you can go to, uh, in almost all the major, well, I would say in all the major world faith traditions, including Christianity, there is um, a group which, as Ms. Shafak was just saying very eloquently, I'm very struck by what she said, that uh, cannot tolerate diversity, cannot tolerate difference. And we have it in Christianity, we have it, uh, you find it in every major world faith. What is it that is happening in our world at the moment that is bringing that out in restored violence in a way that perhaps uh, arguably we've not seen before, and certainly in Christianity we've not seen for, um, since the Reformation, the end of the wars of the Reformation. And uh, there is a theological narrative, and it seems to me that that's filling a vacuum left by an alternative narrative. And I, I think listening to the comments today, I've been very struck by what's been said. All right, uh, lady and gentlemen, stay right there. We're going to take a quick break now, but we're going to be back uh, in just a few minutes with more on this very important debate and on this very important topic, how to counter violence extremism. Stay with us. Right, that was our little, this is our little break. <laughs> This is the time to take, a, to take a sip of water if you would like to. Okay, You're, everyone ready?
Let's do it. Welcome back to Davos and welcome back to this debate on how to counter violent extremism. We are looking at how we can respond to this problem, a global threat with local solutions. And we've talked about the current context. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about what we can do next, what we can do from now on. And I want to pick up on something that you pretty much all mentioned in the first part of the debate, and that is this changing of the narrative. You spoke about uh, marketing, uh, Sir uh, Mohammed, earlier, and I want to ask you about that. How do we market uh, the right message, so to speak, to, to, to convince people not to join Daesh or not to join any other extremist violent uh, group? I think there are a couple of objectives. Um, one is about killing the brand in general. So it's an antibiotic that attacks everything and sort of uh, you know, prevents and works for the future, not just for the immediate term. That is to name and shame them, to show them for who they are. You speak that they are narrow and that they don't have uh, a tolerance for others. Let's amplify that. So who would be Daesh's friends? Let's say um, non-Muslims. X. Within the Muslim community, they don't want the Sufis, they don't want the Shia. When it comes to the Sunnis, they only want a particular kind of Sunnis. So in a sense, this state will never be recognized by anybody. And in actual fact, if some have come to the conclusion that they do not pose an existential threat, I suppose it's because of that. I mean, if you look at the metrics, what are their numbers on the ground in Syria and in Iraq? 30, 40,000, they are lethal because they control territory. They are not a typical terrorist organization. It's a hybrid sort of a monster that you have. Um, they're into everything. They're into slavery. They're into rape. They're into extortion. They're into theft. They're into corruption. I mean, you can list all the sins. They are there. And if you take one or two of those and amplify them to the would-be recruits, that would be enough. You can take someone who has been recruited by Daesh and who has tried to leave if, had, if they weren't killed trying to escape and who are disillusioned and use that story to uh, amplify it. Um, but I think the, um, you have to look at the audience. Who is it that you're trying to influence uh, by this? Um, if it is religion you're trying to protect or to display religion in its pure form, then uh, you must allow that content to be dictated by those who are experts, who by, by the clergy, by the, the Muslim clerics. But oftentimes, people don't want to hear that. They, Daesh is not alluring them with sophisticated theologies. They're alluring them with promises. And you have to be clever in terms of marketing, in terms of how you go about that. For example, just a quick example, and then I, I, will, I will give the chance to others. Um, let us say the audience today, someone, it's very unlikely, wants to join Daesh, and they Google, where is the nearest Daesh recruiting station? You might get some links that might lead you to some terrorist organizations. Now, what if you did that, and the links took you to how to bake cakes, or to change nappies, or uh, how to prune roses in a garden. Now, I know that an attempt was made with a platform that will not be named, uh, a search engine, and they were asked, you know, by companies, they said, we want to buy advertising, we want to be able that the minute someone enters, you know, how to make a bomb, or we want them to be led to this sort of links. And they refused. I, I think they're wrong. I think they have to, uh, businesses, um, platforms like search engines, must think carefully about what it is that they are trying to do. Because uh, sometimes in their, um, they, they, they try to be um, protective of free speech and of liberties, but sometimes uh, that can counter the public. Uh, uh, interest. Um, a final thing, for example, this business of beheadings that we have seen. In my part of the world, 
every five-year-old has an iPhone. And um, these beheadings have been seen and watched by millions of children because that content um, is not prevented. Mm -hmm. There is no law that says you cannot have violent content in my part of the world. It's regulated in Europe and in America, but not everywhere because the legal system has not caught up with the technology yet. So there's that loophole. The effect that this has on children long term is uh, terrible, it's toxic. This must be uh, stopped. So there are a number of things that we can do to clean up the internet the way we would clean up uh, uh, our streets. We have a number of things to, to, to pick up on there in your statements, uh, Mohammed. I, I want to turn to uh, uh, Archbishop Welby with, with, with one question and, and one thing that came out of uh, what Sir Mohammed was just saying. And, he was saying that perhaps sometimes religious leaders should take a step back to a certain extent, if I understood you correctly, uh, Sir Mohammed. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, it's been said that, you know, the Sunni clergy should come forth and defend the religion <coughs> and say, but that's well known. Some of those who've been caught were caught with Islam for dummies in their, <laughs> in their, in their rack sack as they were heading to Syria. Um, yeah, I do agree with his grace that we cannot hide away and say, no, um, the, the scriptures are uh, sacrosanct and they, they, they don't. Maybe there are skeletons and we, sh we should face up to them, but you cannot take texts literally and apply them uh, uh, literally. Let's turn to the Archbishop. What, what, what do you think about that, this, this idea that perhaps it's, it's best for religious leaders to not retreat completely, but take a step back perhaps? The answer to bad religion is not no religion, but good religion. And I think the religious leaders, well, I can only speak for, as a Christian, but as a Christian, I would say that our role is to uh, present the faith uh, of Christ in a way that is so clearly full of the love and grace of God that it is an effective counter-narrative in and of itself, in the communities you see and how they welcome people. For instance, in the dioceses and parishes we have in the Church of England, where you have very significant uh, Muslim majorities. One of my colleagues uh, has been parish priest for 12 years in a parish like that. His relationships with local Muslims are absolutely wonderful. They, there is a constant exchange of friendship, of love, of welcome, of caring for each other when things are tough. It's quite a poor area. Now, that is an effective antidote because it says don't pay attention to these people who say there is no purpose or call or hope for life in, in the West. In, in the example you're seeing, you see lives that are ultimately worthwhile because they're ultimately creative, not destructive. I want to turn to uh, Monsieur Laborde as well. You're a judge. Sir Mohammed was also um, suggesting that there are some things that we can tighten up when it comes to the, to the internet to make, make sure that children, for instance, cannot access videos of atrocities uh, online. Is that, is that feasible from your perspective as a, as a, as a legal expert, so, so to speak, and from the international uh, cooperation perspective? Well, first of all, um, the uh, terrorist organization like Daesh uses so many, so many means. So you, you cannot touch this one. Okay, you know, of course we, we can perhaps do something. And probably the is not a question of a judge. I think that uh, France 24 will do it by itself, not to show uh, all of that. And the social medias also have to do that. What I want to say is that we have to face an organization which is which has means which are very fluid, flexible, and adaptable. So each time you do something, they go to something else. And in, fr and in front of, of them, uh, you have states, governments, civil society, and private sector. So probably here it's an occasion through which we should really link, and, and by the way, also in the civil society, the uh, religion, the representative of religions. So we have really to work, not, we have not to work anymore in silos. We have really to put this into the efforts together. What our colleague said about the counter narrative is absolutely right, the culture, all of that. So that's the first, the first issue. So it, one 
answer will not be the right one. The second one, if we want really to do something uh, through the media, and when they want to do that, you know, um, this probably uh, the words of the victims and the words of the former members of ISIL, which, with which these words which probably the, be the more efficient when they know that they have committed things which should not have been committed against humankind. That's where I see the real responses. Mr. Fak, what do you say about that? Earlier you asked what would make things better. I think in order to understand that, we should also ask ourselves what would make things worse, you know? And things can get worse. I'm afraid things are getting worse as we speak. And in my opinion, we need to analyze um, the practices that might make things even messier. One of that is stereotypes. Uh, unfortunately, extremisms, they benefit enormously from the circulation of stereotypes. Um, I travel a lot east and west, and when I go, when I go to different parts of the Western world, I, I hear lots of women, particularly women, with all the good intentions, in a way saying, thank God I wasn't born over there. And by there, they mean the Middle East, because they say, you know, they think, had I been born there, I would be reduced, you know, I would be suppressed and silenced. So thank God I was born here. Then you go to the Middle East, different cities across the Muslim world, and you come across women, again, with all the good intentions, saying, thank God I wasn't born over there, because they think had they been born over there, they would be reduced to their bodies. Now, when you question these women, how many Jewish friends do you have? How many Christian friends do you have? How many American friends have you got? It's usually zero. But they have an idea about what it means to be the other women, you know, what it means to be the other. Now, all these information, all these stereotypes are making the situation worse. What I'm trying to say is I think we should refrain from generalizations. We make very, very easy generalizations about how Muslims live, how Christians are. There is no such thing as a single identity. Islam, from the very beginning, was multiple interpretations. And today as well, it is multiple voices. It is not a monolithic whole. Travel across the Middle East, you will come across all kinds of different voices conflicting, somehow coexisting, but also clashing. One thing, in my opinion, that we urgently need to emphasize is how extremism in one place affects extremism elsewhere. Fear here triggers fear elsewhere. It is not a solution to say, okay, let's close our doors, erect higher walls, and let them deal with their own problems. I have across, come across people who say such things as well. We, that's not a solution because we're far too much interconnected. The Sufis always used to say, we are all of us interconnected. Our stories are connected. Our destinies are connected. So what I'm trying to say, Islamophobia in one place creates more anti-Western sentiments elsewhere and vice versa. We need to get out of this vicious circle and we need to stop generalizations. But how do we do that practically? How do we break nuances, the stereotypes? Nuances, diversity. We have to understand most of the people who suffered in the hands of Islamic extremism were themselves Muslims who are critical of that interpretation of Islam. You know, there are multiple voices in the history, philosophy. When I read about Islam, Islamic mysticism, it's incredibly similar to Jewish mysticism. When I read about Jewish mysticism, it's amazingly similar to Christian mysticism. The heterodoxies, the mystics, those on the periphery of each Abrahamic religion were always saying the same things. The quest was so similar. But we have lost that. I mean, I hear a lot of talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition. Of course, there's a Judeo-Christian tradition. But do you hear anyone talking about Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition? Why don't we hear anyone talking about that? Is there no continuity? Are there no similarities? Of course there are differences. We can also talk about the differences, but let's also talk about the similarities. So what we're losing is both the diversity within religions, the nuances, but also the emphasis on commonness, similarities, and the extremists benefit from these mutually exclusive fake categories. It plays into their hands. Uh so, Mohammed, I saw that you wanted to come in there. I just want to, to, to read a, a statement that we have received uh, via Twitter on the hashtag F24 Davos from our audience. Uh, now, this statement says that violent, violent extremism can only be defeated by non-violence, adding more policies, controls, etc. only feed violence and maintain fear. Uh, Mr. Shawiz, I want to ask you, do you think that 
perhaps there is too much of an emphasis on military solutions at this point in your country and also elsewhere in the, in the region? Well, first of all, I just want to say I agree 100% with what Shafak said. And I see it, it may be the, the, a successful key for, for solving the problem outside the Middle East. It is a way how to, to, to make a real climate between Muslim, non-Muslims, immigrants, uh, population of the European countries and the Western countries. This will be the key, the way to think about multiplicity and mul multiculture and accepting the other and open height to each other. But I want uh, really to come back to the, the, the main problem. I still think that the main problem is the origin of the main problem of extremism, of Islamic extremism, of Daesh, is in our countries. Is in the Islamic world, in the in Arab uh, countries uh, specifically. Uh, this tendency in Islam was was always there, from the beginning of Islam. It wasn't strong. Sometimes it was strong, sometimes it was weak, but there were there were always people or a group in Islam which. Uh, try to, to, to gain power and, and control everything uh, and, and impose their way of thinking or their way of life on the other people through, uh, through violence, let's say like that. Nowadays in our countries, there is a certain climate which benefits the emergence of, of uh, the strengthening of, of such the thinking of such organization, whether it is Daesh or another organization. Uh, there is sectarism, there is dictatorship, there is corruption, there is injustice, there is no jobs, there is a lot of crisis, crisis which, which will remain as long as the, the shape of the, of the governments uh, will remain in, the, in these countries. So the solution in our countries maybe, maybe is useful to think in a way that the Western countries, the people in our countries will try to found a form suitable to each country. Let's say Tunis in a way, Egypt in a way, in Syria and somewhere else, in Iraq, but which has uh, certain common uh, conditions. Not to dictatorship, not to sectarism, yes to secular, secularism, yes to democracy, yes to partnership, and yes to constitutional institutions. And then after reaching such solutions, such political solutions, these governments, these good governments, can only work and try to achieve justice and flourishing economy that create jobs and let the people live in a way that let them never think to, to hold a, a weapon or, or let them uh, themselves explore, explore and, 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 and kill other people. So, Mohammed, you wanted to come in? I wanted to embrace wholeheartedly what uh, Elif Shafak said, that um, uh, culture, you know, we are experiencing a vacuum uh, in that. There is no curiosity amongst neighbors to learn um, Turkish or Persian or, uh, or Hebrew. And um, when we are so weak in terms of culture, then this allows others to come and uh, divide us. Um, if you think of the vacuums that exist in Syria and to an extent in Iraq, in Yemen, and also in, uh, in Libya. And you reflect on the time when these vacuums didn't exist. I'm not advertising the Gaddafis or the Saddam Husseins of this world. The point I'm making is that um, the ISIS's and Daesh's did not flourish when there was a firm grip. Culture can be a firm grip to keep these people out. Um, 
and accept it. I mean, if you look at um, Budapest, the second largest synagogue, uh, I think, in the world, and the largest in Europe, uh, was built under the Ottomans hundreds of years ago in Turkish style. So this business of embracing other cultures and uh, learning from them existed. Is this happening still? I don't think so. I think that this, we need to go back to that. We need to go back to embracing others, because this also protects us from those who want us to be in silos like, uh, like Nash. Ms. Shafak. I mean, definitely not knowing history, not knowing the past is part of the problem. We have such short memory, a lot of amnesia, cultural uh, collective amnesia going on. In Turkey, I see Istanbul as a city of urban amnesia um, as well. Had we been able to read history, we would, we would know how you know, they, they were able to coexist. But I honestly think we should criticize lots of things in the Middle East too. I mean, lots of things need to change. Uh, the problem is today we are very easily offended. Any word that is critical, immediately we are you know, enraged. Rumi has a very nice line that he mentioned. He said, uttered 800 years ago, he said, if you are irritated by every rub, by every criticism, how is your mirror going to be polished? This is the way we grow. This is the way societies grow. We must emphasize freedom of speech, press freedom, and self-criticism. And if I may add this, I think patriarchy and sexism is, is a very big in, uh, component of the problem. When you travel across the Middle East, more and more street Streets belong to men, public squares belong to men. Women are systematically being pushed into the private space and we are told our primary role is motherhood, the domestic space. We do not exist in politics, in decision making. Very, very little role. That changes everything. So the aggression, the masculinity, over masculinity, a certain type of masculinity <coughs> that's imposed from above, I think it should be on the table and we should discuss that as well. Archbishop. That is? That's our culture, exactly. I, I'm not sure that's our culture. I mean, the patriarchy, you mean? This is the dominant culture in the, in the Middle it East. It is the dominant culture, but that doesn't mean it can't be changed. You know? Should there are changed. moments it should, should be, be changed. changed. And and there are, there are in changed. history, women who are very active. Again, we have erased all information about those women. Archbishop? Uh, once again, I agree. I, th I think um, all the main religious traditions have uh, exhibited a history of uh, patriarchy uh, and uh, that has created a culture in which a group of people, in that case women, were seen as somehow inferior. Once you've done that with one group of people, it's very easy to do it with loads of other groups of people. You've created the atmosphere in which you can demonize or say that a group is dangerous and must be controlled, eliminated, whatever it happens to be. I think that, that we have to be very conscious of that. Again, speaking as a religious leader, within, within uh, many faith traditions and within the Christian tradition, um, there is the idea of the essential dignity of every single human being, regardless of who they are. The reclaiming, the proclamation of that, the absolute standing on that in our political statements, in our commercial actions, in education, uh, in health treatment, in all the key areas of life uh, is essential in order to um, uh, uh, show an alternative way. Monsieur Laborde? Yes. We at the Security Council of the United Nations have perfectly uh, say, uh, identified the issue of uh, the um, importance of the involvement of women First of all, because also there are women in, the, in Daesh, and particularly in France, we have also to, uh, to see that, uh, for example, in August, 40% of the foreign terrorist fighters going to, uh, to Daesh were women. But uh, the point is that um, uh, we had a debate in November in the Security Council on this issue about the involvement of women. And I, I really feel that uh, it is direct, directly connected to the fact that we will never defeat a terrorist organization without the involvement of the civil society. If we speak a bit about civil society, how many women are in the civil society? More than half of the civil society. 
So it means that even in terms of numbers, how we can work on these issues without involving women. Especially also, I would like to say, in the law enforcement forces. In the law enforcement forces, the number of women are so low. So it means that, for example, when you have uh, victims of uh, terrorist organizations, I think about what happened to the Yazi, especially. I say, who will take the statements of these women? Yeah. Only men? How it could be? That's something which is not acceptable. So being a society and fighting against a terrorist organization which really uh, set its basis from on the civil society, how we can do that? That's really something that I am pushing. I am determined to continue to push in the civil society. And, and this is essential in the fight against Daesh. But also, uh, it's not only Daesh. It's how the people join the, the, the Daesh, you know, uh, when there are uh, when they have enough even welfare around them in some places outside of, uh, outside of the Middle East. In Tunisia, yes. You know, after, after the Arab Spring, in which the, uh, Tunisia was a, a kind of first light of the Arab Spring, how many people are going there now? Probably the, one of the highest number in the, in the, of, of the persons uh, joining Daesh come from uh, Tunisia, mm -hmm. etc. So, what is that? It is because probably we have not taken into consideration en enough certain elements, the, the welfare, uh, the development, the fine, as you said, uh, Mohammed, there was no job for these people they are joining, but also because their frustration of not being considered as part of the civil society, especially for the women. At this stage, we are going to turn to the audience here in Davos and we're going to take questions uh, from you. What I'd like you to do is, well, stretch up your arms uh, and uh, let yourself be known to me. We have roving microphones in the room, so I think uh, we will... Yes, the gentleman right there in the, uh, in the front row. Remember, questions, please. Keep them fairly brief. No statements. Could I ask the panel how important they think a resolution in Syria is? to the defeat of Daesh, and are we making progress in that regard? Anybody feels the urge to answer that question? Sir Mohammed? Uh, I think it is essential to destroy them on the ground, because they have built it, uh, this pseudo-caliphate, um, and it is a destination. If that did not exist, as it didn't when they were ruled by uh, Saddam, etc. Then they would lose a lot, um, and also the revenues that they are getting out of corruption and selling oil there. So that is essential, um, but that doesn't mean that that alone uh, would defeat them. I think it's like grass; you, ca you have to keep cutting it. Uh, <laughs> you cannot just do it once and it disappears. Very much like the drug dealers and the drug cartels, they also kill our kids. Um, and you know, you cannot just do one action and, uh, and, and put them to an end. I think it is essential, but um, yeah, you have to address the other issues as well. Now, we have another question from, uh, uh, from, from Twitter, somebody using, once again, the hashtag F24 Davos. Uh, the question is, how can and should social media be used to combat violent extremism? Uh, Ms. Shafak? Yes, I think the role of social media is not analyzed enough because it is so important. There was a time during the Arab Spring, the early stages of Arab Spring, we over-romanticized the role of social media. There was an expectation that Facebook was going to, you know, um, bring more freedom, stories of children being named Facebook. Um, we, should, we should not over-romanticize. The social media is like the moon. It has two sides. It has a bright side and it has a dark side. And we should see both of them. On the dark side, unfortunately, it, it makes it easier to circulate in, in information that serves to the hands of the, of the extremists, misinformation, slander, but hate speech, particularly hate speech against minorities, those who are in a more vulnerable position, it, it, it makes it much more easier. But on the bright side, it really helps people to connect at a more egalitarian level 
And I think that is very important. When you look at Facebook and Twitter users, and the reason why I emphasize these two is for many of my friends in England, for instance, in, in France, in Spain, these platforms are mostly about the movies you watch, the food you eat, the restaurants you, you visit. But for people in Turkey, for instance, Twitter is also about politics. What I'm trying to say is the social media has been very politicized in places where the mainstream media was curbed and there is more and more pressure on press freedoms. You see an importance, uh, an increase in the importance of social media. So these are also political platforms. If I may add this, when you look at the, the statistics, the number of people using social media, we mentioned in the public space women are being pushed back. But in social media, half of Facebook users, Twitter users, are women. And somehow, they find, themselves, they find it easier to express themselves. There's a big potential there that we haven't really tapped into. All right, we have another question in the front row from the lady in blue. Thank you, and thanks to the panel. Very much enjoyed that. Um, I wonder how important you think the word violent is in the title here. Do you think the target of counter radicalization efforts should be on those who don't just have extreme thoughts but want to take actions? Or do you actually also think the target should be just thought, so extreme thought? Mm. Any takers when it comes to that question? Who's there? Archbishop? <laughs> uh, this is a big debate in the UK at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, We have to, there are certain slippery slopes that once you start believing a certain way, it leads you inexorably to violence. If we go back 20 or more years to the Rwanda genocide, the moment you started seeing a group of people as cockroaches, as they were called on the radio, then that might just be a thought, but it opens the way to violence. But we cannot... Uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth I said, we, if you'll excuse the gender-based language, we cannot make windows into men's souls, was the phrase she used. We cannot look into the inner heart of a person. And therefore, I think we have to be very careful about thought control. Um, uh, to educate, yes, to inspire even better, uh, to make things hard to think better still, because they, not just because they're unacceptable, but because it's just contrary to the whole way we look at what a human being is. But to control thought is taking on the values that we are trying to oppose. And so, yes, if it's part of that cockroach thing, the demeaning of people that leads it to be easy to kill and attack them, that has to be dealt with. But, but extremism in its own, who's an extremist? I mean, Martin Luther King, in one sense, was an extremist. And thank God he existed. We have a gentleman in the front row uh, in the blue tie. <coughs> it's uh, <clears throat> on uh, the political side. I think, uh, shouldn't we be showing also tolerance uh, like in Tunisia and in Arab Spring, some governments came into power because people voted for them. But the rest of the world didn't have the tolerance and they were removed, like in Egypt and all. So when we talk of democracy, then we must believe in that. What's your view? I mean, should we, Because we want democracy and if we show tolerance, then some of these religious parties can be spoken to and brought to the table if they got, get elected. Any thoughts on that? Sir Mohammed? I think the example of Tunisia, they have made some very difficult choices. Uh, the people, the politicians in Tunisia from all parties, they agreed to make painful compromises. <laughs> and perhaps they're the only place that painful compromises have been made on the part of the uh, religious parties and the secular parties. Um, and they came to these compromises when they realized that the future would be very bleak if they didn't. It was painful, but it's possible. Now, 
um, the irony in Tunisia is that um, they have not received the FDIs that allow the economy to have the oxygen to function. So they've delivered on democracy. Um, but where is their economy? I think the world has a lot to answer to. That um, in a place like Tunisia that has succeeded in establishing order and bringing um, dissenting parties together, if we don't make sure that that is a success, what are we saying to the people of Yemen? What are we saying to the people of Libya? What are we saying to the people of Syria? Uh, even to the people, you know. So I think we have to be very careful that those people who are successful, that um, we reward them, um, and that by doing so, we are showing others that there is, there is hope that after you've stood up to your dictators and removed them and formed a government, that you'll be rewarded. I have a Tunisian friend who was in the World Bank and was involved in finance. They said, at the time of Ben Ali, the funds were coming. When we got rid of him, uh, there were no investments. And uh, they said that with, uh, with a lot of sadness. Um, we are quickly running out of time. So at this stage, I'm going to ask our panelists to uh, perhaps summarize your thoughts uh, on this session and also what you think what we can do practically at this stage, one step perhaps uh, that, that we can take in order to start resolving this, this issue and to start countering uh, violent extremism. Uh, Jean-Paul Abad, if I may ask, ask you to, to, to start when it comes to this part of the debate. Peace and security will not work without, without inclusive, inclusiveness and especially women. That's my word. It's a very concise message. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Archbishop? I would say uh, you, can't do, you can't create peace and security by doing things to them. You have to be alongside doing things with people. And that, again, brings us back to inclusion. Mm -hmm. Sir Mohammed? I, I say I'm optimistic. I think that... Daesh will be defeated because they don't have much to sell. I think we have to um, improve our act and um, take back the internet uh, from them and work better with the local communities so that they are better equipped to deal with the dilemmas that they are faced if a foreign fighter returns um, or if someone who is showing radical thoughts appears. They need to be able to respond to that better. And governments are doing but they must do a bit more and a bit better to ensure that the local communities, the schools, the, the places of worship, um, the vulnerable, have access to either like an, Al an Alcoholics Anonymous phone line to help the families and those who might be vulnerable to seek some refuge. We can do it, and we can do it easily. It just needs to set our minds to it. Elif Shafak? I think there's a widespread tendency, maybe also connected to your question, to see stability, you know, because we're so in need of stability. We have started to sacrifice democracy. And I find that a very, very dangerous trend. Democracy, freedom of speech, press freedom, women's rights, minority rights, these are not postponable issues. They're urgent issues. They need to be you know, embraced. So my uh, approach would be without abandoning democracy, without abandoning our emphasis on, on democracy, definitely, but also acting as world citizens and multiplying our belongings uh, would be my solution or my approach. Mr. Shavuz? Well, I would like to say that uh, it is a struggle between civil civilization and non-civilization. It is very important to know the root, roots and origin of extremism and, and violence, especially Daesh and Islamic uh, extremism. Uh, it is also important to gather every possible possibility, force to, to tackle this monster uh, on every level, cultural, economical, uh, political, and so on. All right. Uh, we unfortunately have run out of time. This, this uh, session has passed incredibly quick, quickly, and I want to thank you very much indeed, uh, 
uh, for taking part in uh, this session. Uh, I was fascinated by the discussion about changing the message, changing the, the narrative, thinking about marketing, uh, the use of social media in, in, in basically making a positive message and not just a, the, the negative uh, often provided by a Daesh or Islamic State group. I want to thank our audience as well for for being part in uh, today's session and for, for coming up with all of your questions. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank you at home for watching France 24. Do stay with us. Goodbye from Davos. Thank you.